Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Eric, and my appreciation to NORAD for inviting me to join your important conference. A very good morning to everyone. I thought to speak today to a question that may be on the minds of some of you, and that is, why is the IMF speaking front and center of a conference focused on development and humanitarian issues? So let me share with you in this message why economic and social development are top priorities for us and how international cooperation lies at its heart. But I should first touch on the current and biggest crisis of our lifetimes. COVID-19 has called for exceptional actions from all of us. Over the last year, the IMF has moved with unprecedented speed and magnitude to help countries protect the lives and livelihoods of people. We have approved over 100 billion in total financing to more than 80 countries since the start of the pandemic last year. Given their needs, we have focused on our low income member countries by expanding our concessional financing and by providing immediate debt relief to 29 of the poorest, most vulnerable countries. We have also worked closely with the G20 on bilateral debt service relief and on the common framework to address unsustainable sovereign debt. This financing has been critical to support short-term economic stabilization. But for a truly sustainable long-run recovery, countries must also strengthen their economic institutions, such as central banks, and tax administrations. Strong economic institutions are the critical foundation countries need to enable effective policies and to make progress towards the sustainable development goals. And that is why for more than 50 years, the IMF has provided technical assistance and training, capacity development as we call it, to help countries strengthen public finances safeguard financial stability, modernize exchange rate policies, and improve economic governance and transparency. Most people may not know this, but capacity development accounts for nearly a third of the IMF's budget. And since the start of the pandemic, we have provided real-time policy advice and capacity development support to over 175 countries to address urgent issues such as cash management, financial supervision, and debt management. Much of this support has helped countries address the challenges that had not been uh, encountered in the past. For example, how to collect inflation data during a lockdown. This is therefore an import important service we provide, especially in low income and fragile states that need such support badly. We deliver it in conjunction with our global network of 16 capacity development centers. And in the spirit of international cooperation, it is supported by our incredible partners, such as NORAD, which has partnered with us in three of these centers across Africa and Central America. Much of this work is also provided in close collaboration with partners on the ground, including the World Bank and the UN. So what are the fund's capacity development priorities in the period ahead? A big challenge that policymakers now confront is rising public debt, resulting from worsened fiscal positions due to the pandemic. IMF experts have been working closely with them to strengthen their debt management and reduce debt vulnerabilities. And related to that, another crucial effort we are focused on is revenue mobilization a critical endeavor to tackle debt vulnerabilities and create space for development spending. This includes helping many countries manage revenues from natural resources. In fact, we have a dedicated fund to finance support in this area and drawing on its considerable experience in this field, NORAD has been one of the most engaged partners in this effort, providing substantive funding and guidance to our work. We thank you for that, for chairing this fund currently, and for broadly supporting our revenue mobilization efforts. 
Another priority I'd like to highlight is carbon pricing, which is of course relevant from a climate change perspective. The fund estimates that a combination of green investments and appropriate carbon pricing can put us on a path towards net zero emissions by mid-century. But carbon pricing is also important in supporting policymakers' revenue mobilization efforts, all the more important as countries rebuild their revenue base post-pandemic to support the recovery. As we look to exiting this crisis, we expect unusually high demand for our capacity development service. So we have set up a COVID-19 capacity development fund and reached out to our membership for support. And I'm pleased to say that we are getting positive responses from several countries. Let me conclude by acknowledging the critical role you all play in the global development effort. Both as a former policymaker myself and in my roles at the IMF, I have witnessed firsthand the commitment and tenacity of our development partners in the pursuit of reforms. These efforts are often behind the scenes, but they help shape effective and impactful policy. And that can have the greatest long-term impact on the economic and social well-being of people around the world. So thank you very much for your efforts and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much uh, uh, for taking the time to, to be with us and, and also on behalf of NORAD, thank you for those uh, kind words. Uh, it's true that um, the IMF and, and maybe especially on capacity building is an important partner to uh, NORAD. Of course, because we do a lot of work with institu on institutions uh, and institutions are key uh, in almost any policy area, whether it be economic policies, uh, uh, whether it be building trust in society or development of services. And, and um, Antoinette, uh, of course, the International Monetary Fund is also one of a few key global institutions now so important in the economic recovery. And I, and I wanted to, to ask you from your, I mean, from your point of view and the position you do have now, um, looking around us uh, uh, with a, a new American president, but with a lot of challenges uh, with the pandemic, but also economic challenges, how do you view the prospects of uh, cooperation between states uh, in the years to come? Uh, uh, can, do we see an environment of increased cooperation or do we see a more polarized environment uh, uh, around us? Well, thank you so much for uh, that uh, question, uh, Board Vega, uh, which is uh, hugely pertinent uh, at this uh, point in time. And I have to say that I'm optimistic. Uh, I think on the basis of the significant efforts at international cooperation we've seen over the course of uh, the last uh, 10 months since the, the, the crisis broke, uh, that there is indeed uh, 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 a uh, basis for optimism. We've seen uh, a concerted effort, uh, uh, you know, uh, by by countries uh, across the world uh, to put in place uh, fiscal support uh, of the approximately twelve uh, trillion dollars and monetary support of some seven point five uh, trillion dollars that really put a floor under the world economy. Without which, we would be encountering. Uh, the ep economic impact of the crisis that would be devastating. So that is certainly uh, a sign of continued international cooperation we've seen despite the immense challenges across uh, the globe. Um, we've also seen that cooperation in the IMF. Um, uh, our 190 member countries represented in our executive board move very quickly uh, uh, to take a number of uh, critical uh, decisions, uh, including the financing packages I referred to in my, in my speech, um, uh, doubling the access to emergency financing that we provided very quickly, um, putting in place uh, debt service relief from uh, debt payments to the IMF to our poorest member countries, um, and uh, putting in place uh, capacity development support to help countries uh, 
you know, respond through their institutions to, to what they had never uh, witnessed before. So all of that suggests that uh, despite the, uh, the challenges, we continue to see the results, I think, from international cooperation. We also, of course, saw the G20, uh, another very important forum for international cooperation, uh, take some very um, uh, positive actions to support uh, the poorest countries around the world through debt service uh, uh, relief, and more recently through the introduction of the common framework, which will help to deal with uh, uh, sovereign uh, uh, unsustainable debts. So all of that is, is a, a basis for optimism. But having said all of that, of course, the, uh, the challenges are immense. We have uh, a crisis that uh, is still very much with us. And uh, we have a recovery that is not, uh, that is faltering uh, as a result of um, uh, an uptick in cases we've seen recently. And we worry, uh, very uh, seriously worry about the access to vaccines, especially for our poorest member countries. Um, and our ability to get the recovery uh, up and running uh, will not succeed uh, and cannot succeed in the absence of uh, access by all countries everywhere uh, to vaccines. Uh, so a, a sustainable economic recovery is simply not possible uh, unless we have a sustainable, effective resolution of the, of the health crisis. And for that, we need uh, vaccine access. So on the production of vaccines, on the distribution, on, um, on the treatment, um, medical treatments, all of that and testing, uh, we need uh, to fully support the poorest countries across the globe. And that's uh, the, the most immediate uh, challenge for international, international cooperation that we see. Thank you so much for that. And, and uh, we'll speak more just after this, uh, actually, about the, the need for a global distribution of vaccines. And I also have to say, I, in a way, I echo your optimism. I, I sometimes call myself an empirically based optimist because We've seen, you know, when, when humanity, we, when we face a real crisis, whether it be a pandemic or a financial crisis or armed conflict, we have this ability together to, to face it and do something yes. about it. Uh, but at the same time, like you say, the challenges are, are huge. Um, uh, and the, uh, the climate crisis doesn't go away. The sustainability development goals will be harder to reach. So, so uh, we are also at a, you know, at a point in time where the long-term challenges have grown bigger. So I wanted to maybe ask you to, if you were to point to one or two really important long-term economic uh, solutions that are important from your perspective now, what would they be? Um, no, I, I would say, of course, that uh, first and foremost, uh, in the, the immediate time horizon, if we don't exit the crisis, we cannot deal with these longer term challenges. We, so that is the first, again, the first priority uh, for us. And, uh, uh, you know, by and large, that means uh, getting uh, financing uh, up and running to enable countries uh, to access vaccines, to actually uh, uh, exit and deal with the, the health crisis. And uh, for that, of course, we'll need uh, um, uh, highly concessional financing, grants, and uh, continued debt relief for the poorest countries across uh, the globe to be able to make the fiscal space they need to take on uh, the challenge of exiting uh, this crisis. So that's the, the, the first issue, I think. The second one is that, of course, um, the, the pursuit of the sustainable development goals um, and progress towards them has taken a back seat as a result of uh, this crisis. And the SDGs were already uh, challenged and in some difficulty of being achieved uh, in 2019 already. Uh, now with the additional pressures that countries face uh, with the significantly reduced uh, uh, revenue basis and the need to, to spend on the health uh, priority, um, their ability to spend on other areas uh, uh, that are important also in the SDG uh, context is, is really uh, not there. And, and so 
the SDGs are in danger of, of not at all being uh, achieved. And we, we only have, what, some nine years before 2030 arrives. Uh, so again, there, uh, what, what will it take uh, really to, to deal with this? I should say before I come to that question, one other issue that troubles us a lot is the evidence of divergence between uh, countries. Whereas we had seen uh, before for a couple of decades at least, the convergence towards um, uh, higher growth uh, patterns for low, low income countries. And so convergence between the levels of income in the rich countries and the poorer countries. We're now seeing the exact opposite. And many of the achievements of uh, many, many difficult years and investments by donors and governments in the development enterprise are threatened uh, as, re as a result. So uh, this, this divergence is dangerous to our world. Uh, we also have a situation in which uh, some 90 uh, million people are expected to fall below the uh, um, uh, uh, poverty threshold. Uh, uh, and it's, it's very disturbing, all of that. So for, to deal with all of that, of course, financing, again, is a huge, uh, huge need. And I, I, I spoke to the need for concessional financing, for debt relief, for grants, grants especially for the poorest countries and the most fragile ones that have the, the biggest challenges to address. Um, so those, those are things we have to work on. Uh, uh, together. Having said all of that, it goes without saying, of course, that a uh, country's own commitment to the reform effort and their investment in that with the support of their populations is, is a critical element of making progress towards the SDGs. Uh, and, uh, you know, the institutional uh, building support uh, that we uh, and others across the globe provide countries is also critical. So we very much uh, 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 make a plea uh, to our um, uh, member countries and uh, the international community that this is the biggest challenge of our lifetimes and it requires uh, a joint effort to resolve them. I think that was a suitable end to our, our brief conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Antoinette, for taking time to be with us. Thanks for our good cooperation uh, and, uh, and for, uh, to everyone. I'm sure we've, we've uh, had a great time listening to you. Bye. Well, I can't thank you enough, uh, Board Vegar, for this opportunity uh, to join uh, NORAD in this very, very important conference and uh, uh, to, 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 to share with you uh, how, how uh, committed the IMF is uh, to strengthening the multilateral cooperation we need to address this un unfathomable crisis. Thank you very much. And see you.